Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio on February 24th, 2016. This is host Andrew Fisher, broadcasting Wednesdays from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. I must say, I feel really energized to do a show today. Just got back from the In 5D conference, where topics, among other things, were DNA activation and a lot of other spiritual metaphysical stuff, because that's what In 5D is all about. Greg Prescott and Michelle Walling know their shit and know who to get on the conferences and on N5D Radio, for that matter, which I love listening to. Of course, Crystal Sand on the Beach energized me. Got a really bad sunburn, but because I don't wear suntan lotion, and I shouldn't because suntan lotion causes skin cancer, and I, it's, it's still ca- kind of um, up in the air as to whether sunlight is completely good for you or still has some harmful qualities. I know all the harmful stuff they tell us about the sun is, is bullcrap, but... I mean, there could still be some harm, you know, with the ozone layer being damaged by chemtrails and such. But anyway, that N5D conference energized me. I feel enlightened, energized, spiritually enhanced, and all the rest. So I'm ready to do a show today. And on the show, Laurie Boggs, Keys to Attaining Love, Light, Freedom, and Abolishing Fear. Laurie um, Boggs brings a seasoned perspective that can only be offered by a survivor. She is a child of alcoholics, survivor of a drug driving crash legislative reformer, grieving parent, public speaker, interfaith minister, after-death communicator, intuitive, inspirational teacher, and an integrative spiritual and energetic coach. She teaches to love and forgive, which is the key to light, love, and free, which is uh, her website for that matter. Uh, LaurieBoggs.com is the site. Um, on the top of the page, it says light, love, and free is the key. And there is a uh, someone in the Q here, area code 208. Laura, if that is you, I will get you on it no later than 10 after the hour. <clears throat> but first, as usual, the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. And uh, before I get into the news, a couple of things about Alex Jones that I think need to be pointed out. And I don't know if I should say I'm going to clarify anything, but I was watching one of Mr. Cat Eye's videos yesterday. I enjoy Mr. Cat Eye's videos very much. I think, uh, well, maybe he is being a little too insane with what he thinks the code is and how to get the codes and such in his videos where he decodes crop circles, Google doodles and, and other things. Uh, I mean, he, he seems pretty spot on with a lot of things though. And I'm sure he deserves a lot more credit than people give him. But he said on his um, video yesterday that Alex Jones works for the Mossad and Zionists and that his interview with Louis Farrakhan was like for all intents and purposes, preparation for a possible assassination of Louis Farrakhan in that landmark over two hour interview where I didn't watch it, but a lot of people, a lot of people did thought it was worth watching. And, um, I mean, it, it doesn't uh, seem right there. I mean, Alex Jones, uh, he seems like a devout Christian and even though he doesn't cover the Mossad or the Vatican or any specific things like that, he doesn't feel it's better to go after anyone specific. It's better to just fight the new world order as a collective whole. And he's that's why he doesn't talk about it. But some people suggest that that's why he's a Mossad agent. And his microphone has like six points on it, like a six-pointed uh, star that the that Israel uses as its um, Saturnic symbolism logo. I mean, microphones have that customary um, shape on them. Just go to Best Buy and you'll see for yourself. George Nor even clarified that. And also, I saw another video where Douglas Dietrich talked about how Alex used to work for um, uh, Russian intelligence, um, and it was he appeared on Russia Today in the past often. Um, I don't know what what uh, everything that Douglas Dietrich said. Um, it was a short video, a lot of quick things in that video, but I don't buy that either. I don't, don't buy the Rothschild Mossad thing for Alex. Don't buy that he's a Russian agent and all that. These people are probably getting fed. Uh, bogus disinfo to paint truthers in a negative light like Alex. I mean, a lot of people in the truth movement do find Alex Jones appalling and such, but he shows no signs of being a fraud. And when I had Rob Dew and Dan Badani on my show, they seem genuine. But anyway, Mr. Cat Eye, Douglas Dietrich, you guys must be getting false info. But anyway, I got to do the news on the fly here because I got only like six minutes left before I got to get Laurie on. First article, why the establishment attacks uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and why the liberal media hates socialist Bernie. While airing a Bernie Sanders event, MSNBC cut away from Sanders criticizing the TPP, but here's why. Well, there's a video there. I don't have time to, to watch it and such, but to show it or anything. But Trump, is Trump, what, could Trump be a great president? Well, if he's, a lot of things he says, if he says that he's going to act like that, then I one would have to say yes. But on the other hand, people seem to think, some people think he's a, red herring of sorts in regards to this whole presidential race and 
he uh, wouldn't be all that good. Well, you have to ask them why they would believe that, but it's still up in the air as to whether I want to be a Trump supporter or not. Uh, next article, leftist mob threatens mafia-style attacks on Germans who protested against refugees. If you scare one more refugee, this is a quote, if you scare one more refugee, there will be consequences for you. A militant pro-refugee left-wing mob has threatened mo- violent mafia-style attacks on residents of a German village in retaliation for them protesting against the arrival of a group <clears throat> of migrants. Well, I'm going to make it uh, clear, folks. I, well, I always make this clear whenever I talk about this issue. My, my state's on Ill- illegal immigration. I mean, I would love to see the day we could all cross borders um, without government permission or paperwork filing and people could sail their ships into international ports and waterways without having to go through some sort of an Ellis Island type procedure to immigrate into this country. I mean, one might say, why should our right to create borders and do a vetting process on anyone who crosses the border, why should that right of the people of a country clash with one's right to travel, right to liberty, right to locomotion, and to be able to not be interrupted for crossing an international border. You can imagine an illegal immigrant getting, well, illegal immigrants don't really get arrested much anymore whenever they uh, cross the border because there's a conspiracy to let illegal immigrants in. But those that do get arrested will wonder, why is it that Americans can cross state borders and Canadians and uh, Australians and even Chinese can cross provinces within their their country, provinces, those countries are basically equivalent of states, and I don't know this difference between a state and a province, excuse my ignorance there, but anyway, um, like, why can't we do that within or at an international level, some would say? Well, for one, there is, like I said, a conspiracy to bring illegal immigrants into a country to um, destroy the civilization, take our jobs, and do all sorts of bad, cloward, and piven things to, to humanity, and... Uh, just because of that, it certainly is not a bad idea to vet illegal immigrants, not to mention in this duality matrix that we live in, uh, not all borders are created equal. A country like Switzerland, that bo- all the countries that border Switzerland would not be so concerned as the board, as America would with its border with Mexico. No offense to Mexicans or anything like that intended, but there is a major difference between the Canadian-American border and the Mexican-American border. And, well, that shows my point that that's how borders work, so... That the illegal immigrants treat immigration as a privilege, not a bad idea. Next article, judge lets drunk illegal immigrant go after killing Nebraska woman. Hearing lasted just minutes. My daughter's life accounts for more than freaking $5,000 to bail him out. Uh, quote there. More information has emerged on just how an illegal immigrant who killed a Nebraska woman in a drunk driving incident was allowed to get out of jail and skip town in future punishment. Well, I think it only makes sense for me to ask Lori Boggs about this issue, um, about the illegal immigrants getting off on drunk driving. It's... Uh, it's one of those nobody should be above the law. I mean, if you sign a contract with somebody, there are times where it's okay to violate your rights if that's part of the contract you got got in, that it, they could take your rights away in regard. But just because someone's an illegal immigrant, definitely no excuse to – definitely no excuse to um, let them get away on things like this. Well, the term drunk driving or DUI, DWI has some legal implications behind it. I'll get to that when I – Speak to Lori a little later in the interview, see what she has to say about that. Uh, four ways to stop caring what people think about you. <laughs> Interesting article. How can you become more of a Howard uh, Rourke and less of a Peter uh, Keating? Well, it's an Anthony Gucciardi video, but um, I think considering the fear of what other people think is the biggest prison you could possibly live in, this may not be a bad video for everybody to to watch. <laughs> uh, f- and that's what holds the uh, uh, control system Illuminati together, because people fear what others think of them. Got to get over that fear, folks. Next article, Fox host grills Lee on blocking uh, Supreme Court um, of the United States SCOTUS nomination. Your attitude is surprising. Argued that it's tradition not to confirm Supreme Court nominees during election years. All right, this whole issue of whether it's a tradition or whether Obama has – look, the Constitution – the way the Constitution says the, the, Supreme, the, the Supreme Court justice should be nominated, that's the way it's done but this whole issue of whether Obama should do it or the next president should do it, um, I don't think the Constitution talks about that specifically. They just say it's tradition, but, well, you make your choice there. But Fox News' is Martha McCallum quiz Senator Mike Lee of Utah on, state, on Senate Republicans' decision to deny President Obama's Supreme Court nominee a hearing, telling the senator that his position is surprising given his reverence to the Constitution. Well, is Obama going to obey the Constitution? I don't think so. And by the way, the New World Order Illuminati killed Judge Scalier because he was turning to the good side and leaving the dark side. Uh, next article. Oh, I already talked about this one. Uh, okay, business owner arms entire staff to combat rising crime rate. I would not want to come into one of my facilities. Well, this Georgia business owner takes a second up to a whole new level. 
wants his employees to carry a firearm. Well, good for you, because the criminals will not commit guns, in, uh, and tyrants will not commit tyranny in places where the citizens have guns to arm themselves. If you don't believe in using violence to escalate violence, you might be better off without a gun, but not everybody believes that way, so they, it's certainly a good idea for them to have guns, I guess, and use it to defend yourself, and the Tyrants want to take it so they can control our lives, and the Founding Fathers understood that. That's why they put the Second Amendment in there, so don't lose the right to bear arms or we lose everything. Uh, last two articles, Kerry's Plan B, carving up Syria. Plan B is, in fact, Plan A. John Kerry, Secretary of State, said on Tuesday that the United States will push to balkanize Syria if a planned ceasefire falls. Yeah, it's just a new world order plot with uh, John Kerry, a uh, Zionist minion, and some say a reptile alien, too. Um, he uh, knows all about the... Uh, plot that the New World Order has to kick Bashar al-Assad out and uh, put a, a better puppet in for them. So, uh, all right, well, enough of that. Uh, Lori Boggs, I believe this is her. Area code 208, is this Lori Boggs? Yes, it is. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm glad uh, glad to have you on. Uh, I don't remember who it was that recommended you, but I do believe someone recommended you and uh, saw your website, a very interesting subject here, and... Uh, I had a Joanne Rossi as a guest on my show, one of my best fans, Sean Mugger Cohen's uh, best friends, uh, and uh, talked a lot about um, how to get off alcohol addiction and such. So somewhat familiar with a lot of this, but hey, we could uh, talk about it all over again because it's definitely a subject that bears repeating because alcohol is so designed to screw up our lives in uh, so many ways, suppress our consciousness and all the rest of it. Um, we can get into that later, but I guess we'll start off um, talking about you um, your life experiences and how you died twice in head-on collision and what exactly you mean when you say died twice. Um, set this tone for this interview. I'd like you to give your life experience and also you can talk about how people will contact you. I do that at the beginning of shows instead of the end of shows with my guests. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And I do appreciate being on the show and sharing the story. Um, you can contact me at uh, lauriebogs.com. And you can just email me off that website if I can get back to you. Um, I will start with the beginning of my story, which was when I was born. And um, I was born to both to two parents of alcoholics. And I believe that my parents were very, very, very sensitive like I am now. And there is no coping skills out there for alcohol and for sensitivity so people drink to numb them out. And... I know that's what is in my DNA very heavily on both sides. So anyways, as I was born into this family, of course, with any alcoholic family and dysfunctional family, there is a lot of neglect and a lot of what I call hijacking and interference in the family realm. And as a child, I think what happens to a child is they absorb the energy so that they can live in the chaos. And I know that's what happened with me. And um, as high insight and as I get more energy savvy, and as I grew up, both my parents um, started driving drunk, my dad mainly, but my mother okayed it. And it was very, very, very scary as a child because you can see and know as a child when your parents are being taken over by something and it's not them. And that's what I saw a lot. And it was hard for me to express as a child. I didn't know how to express it. All I could do was cry and tell my dad to please pull over and let us out and not kill the family. But every time I did that, he would just get madder, and the chaos and the drama um, escalated. So I was just really taught to be, be quiet, to not create any chaos or drama, and just watch and, and hold on for dear life, which I did a lot in the car. And um, as I grew up, I didn't know, you know, that the energy follows you, and it becomes in your holographic field is what I would say. And I, and I was wearing it. And I started um, noticing when I was a teenager and all my friends started drinking, um, I started being the designated driver, them home safe, and really started being accountable that way. And then I had two friends in work when I was 20 years old that they were decapitated when they were driving drunk home from a party that I was at. So it was just one thing after another, and then... Uh, you know, mothers against drivers kind of started coming into the picture a little bit. So there was some consciousness about it, but not a whole lot. But then I did hit, I did hit a while where I drove drunk a little bit myself, and I really didn't like it, so I didn't do it anymore. 
that, to be honest with you, I was pulled over six times for a DUI. And because I was beautiful and I had long legs and I could and I could use my body, um, and plus I passed the test, um, you know, the drunk driving test, they let me go. And I just want to be really accountable and really honest here because I think that's how we heal as a, as a collective conscience. And um, through that, I met my husband, and we went through um, seven years of infertility, three miscarriages, and four surgeries in order to bring our little Preston in. And um, it was uh, a miracle that he was born. And I remember when he was born, the day he was born, I wanted to put him in a bubble so he could be safe. Because in my own inner system, I felt very unsafe. But I didn't understand what that all meant at that point in time. And as we went on as a family, um, a Preston showed me um, God, the purest love I've ever felt. Um, as a child, just gives us so much of that love, just that pure heart love without any agendas. And I felt very blessed and so did my husband to have this little boy. And I'm not saying this just because um, he was my child, because I believe they're all, you know, God's children or mother's children, however we want to, you know, whatever label we want to put on this. But, um, you know, I was taught in a parenting class to tell him he was on top, in tune, and in touch every day. And what that did is that really created a force field for him to really be in his power. And what I loved about that little guy is he just said how it was, and there was really no fear around him. He just called, you know, everything black and white. And he was pretty wise for his age. And anyways, when he turned about five, I started having fear come into my field. And I just took a a class called Holographic Kinetics May. And basically, he told me to take it. My son, I still have after death communication with him. And anyway, so I went ahead and um, took the class, but let me go back to the story. And so fear started coming into my space. And I didn't know what it was. Um, I thought it was an angel because at that point in time, I mean, this is probably back in the 1993s. This is when, you know, the new age was coming out and they say how to talk with your angels. And so that's what I was kind of dipping into. I was asking how to talk with my angels. And then I would hear these messages, you know, your son's going to die by the time he's eight. I would hear, don't buy that coat. He's not going to wear it. And there was some evidence that was creating that he was going to die. And I would go to my husband, and I would freak out and show him the evidence. And my husband didn't know what to do. And I went to my unity minister, and he didn't know what to do. He just basically said, it's just fear, let's just pray. Nobody had the the tools for me at that point in time on what to do, because there are tools that I know now, and I'm sure this is one reason why this happened. And um, so anyways, you know, we prayed, and then I was told to move out of Utah, where I'm from, to Orland, Wyoming. So we did, and what I was trying to do was put Preston in a smaller, safer environment so I could save my son. And I want you to really hear this, so I could save my son. That's a really grandosity right there. I am not the one to save my son. But at that point in time, I didn't understand that concept. I just knew I was his mother, and I needed to do what it was, did I, I needed to do what it was going to take to save him. So when we got to Worland, Wyoming, there was even more evidence that he was going to die. I was hoping that, um, you know, when we got there, that things were going to go the opposite way and the energy was going to lessen, but but intensified. And then I realized that back in the day in Wyoming, um, Jackson, Wyoming, that's where my family went on a trip. And I could feel like this no time and kind of deja vu going on in my field. And it was that point in time was one of the scariest episodes with my father. And we were in the trailer as children, and my mother was passed out in the trailer with us. 
And he gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning and decides to drive down the mountain. And we're in the back of the trailer, and all the dishes are coming out and breaking, and the pans are coming out, and we're going back and forth, and all we can see is the, the, t- the treetop of the cl- of, on the cliff. And it just feels like any time this trailer is going to go over, we're screaming at him to let us out. And we can see him up front. He's ignoring us. And we can see that he's drinking his vodka. Now, this is 6, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm just giving you this picture. So do you understand how sick he was? And he just decided that he wanted to get off the mountain and get an early start and get home. But when he wake up, the first thing he would do is drink. And um, so we get to the bottom of the mountain, and the trailer hook pitch came off when he pulled up to the gas station. And all the people came around and was like, wow, you're really lucky that didn't come off. And so, you know, right then and there, just kind of to show you where the, um, the, really the traumatic abuse that was going on in a vehicle that I don't think most people see or understand when a child is in the drunk driver with a parent. And so anyways, that heavy imprint wore on me, and now we're back in Wyoming again. And just a few days before the car wreck, I said to Preston, I said, sweet pig, I said, don't, please don't leave me. And he didn't say anything. He didn't say a word to me. And I thought, well, that's odd. And then something came through to me, and I just said, the show on the road. And during that time period, my father had passed and my mother had passed already. And I could really feel their energy around me. And it was just six short weeks after we lived, we lived to, we moved to Wyoming. And I have to tell you, because I didn't have tools, I didn't know anything about energy. Um, I picked a house that had no grass, and my my energy system, I call it, really needed to be grounded. Really needed to be grounded. I didn't understand what that meant because we didn't have what we have today. But the house we picked was out in the country on two acres with um, the bighorn behind us, the river, and farmland in front of us, and then about two acres between each house. And it was a dream come true for me, a dream, a dream come true so I could heal. I just didn't know what it looked like. So six weeks after we were there, um, up on that hill, there was no curtains, and it was very, very hot in about 108 degrees weather on a July 24th afternoon. And we decided to go shopping that day. And I drove because I had to drive because I had such that trauma in my body, which at that point in time I didn't know was trauma. And so I drove to Riverton, Wyoming, which is about two hours away, and we had a great time shopping together. Um, We bought everything for the house. And then I was um, an alcoholic at that point in time. And so I went ahead and I stopped at the at the drug store at the wine store and bought wine. And I just had a really eerie feeling because the wine store was a bar, and it just felt all familiar to me. Everything was just kind of like the time, like time stopped. And the reason why I was an alcoholic, and I want you to understand this piece, is I didn't have any coping mechanism, and the only thing I knew how to cope was, again, alcohol, just like my parents. So as we both know, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I didn't know how to shut out the messages. But I was intuitive enough to know that maybe I could stop this wreck from happening or his death. I didn't know it was going to be a car wreck. I didn't know how he was going to die. All I was trying to do was stopping it. So on some level, I was mind control, thinking if I did what Jesus could do, drink two glasses of red wine, I could get the information I needed. Well, my energy would never stop at two glasses of red wine. It would always go to, you know, half a bottle or bottle. Um, I just did not have the gauge in me to know when to stop. And so at this point in time, I'm not driving. I, I know I didn't drive drunk. I never drove drunk with Preston ever, except for one occurrence. And that was right after we had moved to Wyoming, probably about three weeks in. The stress was getting to me. My husband has multiple sclerosis. That was high stress for me to handle, too. Since we just moved here, the fear was coming in very thick. 
Um, and so the drinking really ramped up for me to cope. My husband got mad at me and threw me, which I thought he threw me. I'm being a victim at this point in state. At this point in time, I got up and I was mad at him. He didn't throw me. I just said that because that's the way I perceived it in my victim state. And um, I said, come on, Preston, you're coming with me. I got in the vehicle, and I drove about a mile and a half. And Preston said, Mommy, why did you and Daddy fight like that? Because we would never do that with Preston. We, he was, we really kept Preston in as much peace as possible because I didn't want him to go through the, through the thing I was going through. And I said, I'm sorry, Bubba. We need to get you home. I realized right then I was driving drunk with my child, and I had to return home. And I returned home, and the next day Preston said to me, Mommy, are you okay? And I says, I don't know. And he goes, what's wrong with you? And I says, Preston, it's just stress. And it wasn't just stress. It was I was a very sick individual. And um, so this was, you know, four weeks later, we're shopping. Now, again, I'll go back to the story. We're shopping, and I'm driving. I'm sober. I'm driving home. It's 4.30 in the afternoon, and my husband's reading a magazine. Preston's in the back seat of the car, and he's singing, um, You Are a Woman and Having a Good Time, and I'm driving, and as I'm driving, I notice a car, a, a truck in front of us is this white truck, and he, I'm just noticing that, and then I'm noticing people on the two-way highway pulled over. And so I said to my husband, somebody must have been having a blowout or there's some kind, there's some kind of trouble that they had. So I knew to be alert. I knew to, I knew to be on guard. Pretty soon, in seconds, that white truck that was in front of me swerved out of the way, and then what was coming at me was this other car. There was not enough time for me to move. All I could do is move to the right and, and hope that he would move out of my way. What he did is he became affixed to my vehicle. When we're in addiction, a fixation goes along with it. So he became affixed to my vehicle. Anywhere I turned the wheel, he followed me. Um, so there was no way out. And then we were hit head on. We were both going about 65, 75 miles an hour. When we were hit head on, I saw, um, you know, it looked like just black crap escape from my field. I call it a monster in my book, hitting fear head on. Um, anyways, it escaped from my field, and I'm like, what's that? And then I hear like an angel or something come down and say, remember this. You need to remember this. So I'm like, all right, I need to remember this. I got this. I look over at my husband. He had been scalped by the windshield, and just blood was going down his face. And I can't even move. The car is on top of me, on top of my lap. And I, in, the, in my book, I explain it. I'm being molested by my own vehicle. Um, I, can't, I can't move anywhere. And I can't even turn around to see if my little Preston's okay. Then I, hear, I see a woman going crazy around the car. I used to be a smoker, and I quit seven years prior to that. And she came up and offered me a cigarette, and I said no. And she was crazy. She was going, she was like, she lost it. She was crazy. I had no idea what was going on in the other car. I, I don't know. I was just concerned about, you know, I'm stuck, and is my son okay? And, and I knew, you know, on some level that God would not take my child that we tried so hard for. You know, I just kept saying there's no way. And then Preston said, Daddy, what happened? And at that point in time, I was just like, yay, he's alive, and he's okay. And then my my husband, with blood all over his face, said, we've been in a bad car wreck. And then in minutes, they had whisked um, my son and my husband out of the vehicle. And I was trapped in the car, and so they had to get the jaws of life to get me out. And this woman came and sat by me. And she started taking off all my rings. And she just said, you poor woman, you poor woman, you poor woman. And I couldn't figure out, you know, why, because I was in such shock. I couldn't figure out. I didn't feel like I was a poor woman at this point in time because I was in shock. But um, the EMT had told me that my son and my husband was alive. 
So, you know, I was feeling pretty good that I was the only one that was injured. So that's when she's saying, poor women, I'm like, well, you know, they're alive, so I'm feeling, you know, pretty good at right this point in time. So it took, you know, 45 minutes for them to get me out of the car. That was really, really very intense. Um, you know, to feel that metal being cut around you and having the trust of these EMTs and to really, you know, honor their grace for the what they do. I mean, it's just when you're in that reality, you can really have the compassion of what they go through. And so when um, they got me out of the car, um, they put me, of course, in the ambulance and they, they cut off my $50 bra that I just bought. I was really kind of pissed off about that and let them know. And um, and then I just, you know, the pain was so intense. I was asking them for pain medicine, and they wouldn't give me any. They said I lost 11 pints of blood, and there was no way they could give me any pain medicine. So I got rushed to the, the Riverton Hospital in Wyoming, and um, they started putting chest tubes in my lungs because my lungs had collapsed, and they were removing my spleen because my spleen had collapsed, and I was on, you know, life or death situation. As they were removing my spleen and as they were putting the chest tubes in, I could feel everything in the surgery. It was totally, totally, um, the, the pain was incredible. I can't even tell you how horrific that was. That was another trauma. Um, through that, I waved my hands, letting the staff know I needed help. And the staff um, said, Somebody said, look, poor woman, she's spasming. Not only has she been through this horrific day, but she's lost her son. Now, I couldn't talk because I was intubated. But, you know, that's how I found out Preston was killed. Why? I'm not, I'm not under anesthetic and I'm being carved out by a knife. And I just said, God, I cannot take any more. I am done. At that point in time, and um, that's when I went out of my body, Andrew, and I had my near-death experience. And through my near-death experience, um, you know, it's like the typical near-death experience. You know, it was the beautiful colors. It was the tunnels. You know, no map needed for me. I, I get a little bit, you know, mixed up on directions, but I really appreciate it. My system knew exactly where to go. There was no map needed. It was just, you know, just through this beautiful tunnel. A beautiful, vibrant, royal blue and um, pink type colors. Um, so then I get to the door and it's opened up and lo and behold, it's Preston. And in my book, I call it God, it was Source, whatever you want to call it. To me, it was a definitely high being of light. And, um, uh, you know, I was mad and angry and I said, you know, what are you doing? Or are you taking my son? And this is bullshit. I was very angry. I didn't care that it was whatever this high being, because I'm pretty black and white, as you can probably already tell. And um, and then they then God, we'll just call it God for now, showed me this film strip. And it was a film strip of all the fear of Preston dying, all the fears I had, because it goes into the book of each fear that, that was happening to me. So I'm seeing this film strip, and I'm trying to make sense of it, and I'm going, okay, you know. And I'm still mad, and I says, I don't care. I want Preston back. I want, it, I want my son back. And then they showed me Preston in a, com a comatose state as a vegetable. And God said, if he comes back, you'll be the vegetable for the rest of his life. Is this really what you want for your son? You know, I had to really think about that. And I'm like, Yeah. I do. I'll change his diapers. I don't care what it will take. I'll do everything to be with my son. And then Preston looked up at me and said, Mommy, I don't want to go back in that body. Mommy, I don't. And at that point in time, Andrew, I knew it was more love to let him go. And so I said, okay. And then Preston said, Mommy, you need to go back. You have work to do so one day you can be with me. So I said, okay, and then that light and pressed it, that light took pressed into his heart and then put me in his arms and said, he's in the safest place there is, and you will have support. Then I was pushed out of the realm, and um, at that point in time, I explained it like I was pushed into a pair of shoes two sizes too small, and I was being life blighted. And what I know here in sight, high in sight, you know, they had to do surgery on my legs and all that. 
but during surgery, that's when we told we found out like four years later that I was touch and go in in uh, Riverton, Wyoming. They didn't clean up my legs because they just put me off to dying, and then that's when my other near death happened. But I will go into that in a minute. So Riverton didn't clean up my legs. They just thought I was going to die, and that was just where where when I get a Casper, they do emergency surgery on me, and they give me an over amount of antibiotics because my legs were not cleaned up and I got an infection. I was in a coma for um, 18 days. Um, I had a craniotomy. As you know, as I told you, my lungs were collapsed and, um, you know, my, my, my legs were shattered. They told me I would never walk again. Um, I had a lacerated liver and broken ribs on both sides. And then my teeth were shattered. Um, and my uh, under my socket was shattered in my eye, and then I had a craniotomy, and then a, a, a fierce brain injury. And so, you know, when you go through something like that, you, I mean, I don't even know how I made it. I mean, you know that there's a higher something for you to make it. And then my husband, he um, he was in ICU with me for three days, and he he almost died from a lacerated seat belt with on his on his uh, liver. So, but he came out okay, and then he also had broken legs and scalped from that windshield, and then he also went into a pretty severe MS attack after that. And so, you know, the guy that drove, he was an uninsured motorist, repeat offender, and his little boy died eight, my little Preston died eight, and his little girl died six, and his girlfriend died, um, and I think she was like 35, and this guy that was driving was 37, the same age I was, we both just had birthdays like three or four days prior. Just showing you that so you can see the mirror and the setup, how the universe, how this was set up. Um, then, uh, the, so then when I came out of a coma, so then before I came out of the coma, they told my family they were going to lose me during a MRSA now because now the antibiotics put a systemic yeast infection throughout my whole body system and that bug was just invading my body, and they said, prepare for her to die. She's going to die with this bug. And um, then what I remember is a nurse slapping me. I was finally in this void, this beautiful, dark void, and it was the most peaceful feeling I had ever felt in my whole entire life, and I knew I was home. And I just wanted to be there. And the funny thing is there was nobody else around. It was just me. But it felt so safe and so beautiful. And then at that point is when the nurses started slapping my face. I'm in ICU, and they're saying, wake up, wake up, don't you die on us, don't you die on us, don't you die on us. That's when I came out of that near death, and I was pissed. I was very pissed at that point in time because it was so beautiful. But now I see high insight again is I got to experience two near-death experiences. Uh, One was to be anchored into the heart of Mother Earth, and then to one was to be anchored into the the heart of God, into the, you know, the Son of God heart. So that I could feel that in my system and experience it and then transmute it on this planet, and that's what I'm doing now with my story. And through that... uh, after the 20-day coma, I woke up. They tried to tell me Preston was killed. I said, no, I was just with him and his two new puppies. We had puppies. We were playing, I believe, you know, on the astral realm. We were laughing. We were having a good It was really hard for me to come back in this 3D world when I had been in these other realities with Preston trying to make sense of it. And, you know, I came back, and I just started hearing Preston talking to me right away. And he was just telling me that he was going to guide me and help me so that um, to help me through this because I had a a long road that I needed to go through. And the first thing I was told is I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to walk again. And I was also told I was going to be so brain injured that I was going to need a caregiver for the rest of my life, you know, like a nursing caregiver type situation. And then Preston, I just heard in the back of, the back of my mind saying, Mommy, don't believe them. Don't believe them, Mommy. 
don't buy the spell, Mommy. I mean, it was that, like that knowingness. So I just didn't buy the spell. You know, I didn't buy what the doctor said, and I said, you know, I'm going to come out of this, and I'm going to walk to my son's funeral. I will be doing that. And so I just kind of anchored that in for myself, and then I was out of the hospital 70 days. Preston was buried 45 days after the time of the wreck, and I did um, walk to his um, funeral and, um, you know, release him, and I was told I did not want the Bible to be part of the funeral, and it was very, very um, confusing for for Orland, Wyoming, because they had 25 churches and 25 bars, and I did not want the Bible in my son's um, celebration of going home, and there's reasons for that, and I think some people on the call probably already know this, and um, then after that, uh, I came home, and it was our 16th anniversary, my, my husband and I, and this woman that had babysat Preston the day before the car wreck, I had run into town, and she watched him for a few minutes, and she heard of the car wreck on the radio, and um, she went into the, the room Preston was playing in, and I don't know if you saw that picture, it's on my website, and picture had that Preston had drew this picture the day before the car wreck. And it's a picture of him and God in the clouds. There's a sun. There's an eagle. There's our house in Orland, Wyoming, Bighorn River. And in the Bighorn River, there's a shark going upstream. And about a year after the, the, the crash, and I'd gone through a lot of grief, and I was going through a lot, and I finally got quiet enough to ask Preston, what are you trying to tell me with this picture? And he said, Mom, soar high like me and God and fly with the eagles, which he would show up in the spirit of eagles. And he would say, stay out of the illusion so the fear doesn't eat you alive, meaning the sharks, so the sharks don't eat you alive. And so, you know, there's a very potent message in that that he left behind for all of us to see. And um, and then the healing just took place. And, you know, 14, 15 years this summer, I'm still on disability, and I'm doing my best, but I have come a very, very, very long ways. I don't think most people would have made it out of what I've made out of because I have higher, higher help, and I think that we all do it, but we just have to know how to tap into it and keep the interference out. Do you have questions? Well, that was indeed a very, very heartwarming story, and my uh, listeners in the uh, chat room would definitely agree with that. And, um, well, I'm glad I gave you the floor to talk about your life story because um, a lot of people will be very moved by that for sure. And uh, that was wholly new to me, seeing you uh, talk to your son in the near-death experience and uh, realizing when you before you went back he wasn't going to come back. I don't think I've ever heard anything as profound as that in quite a while. But um, you, the, I guess we'll move on to... Uh, the keys to light, love, and free, which is to love and forgive. Well, let's specifically go to forgiveness. Dolores Cannon, the late Dolores Cannon, often talks about how you got to uh, forgive. Forgive is the best way to resolve karma in so many ways, and I'm, I'm guessing you agree with that. But uh, how do you suggest people forgive when there are just some things in, uh, out there that they say, oh, I don't know how I can forgive this. It was so unpleasant what he or she did to me. So the ways to forgive, to um, resolve karma and get light, love, and free, you got the floor. Um, thank you, Andrew. You know, I think forgiveness is a process, and it's um, something that doesn't happen overnight sometimes, and sometimes it does. For me, it was a process. At this point in time, I was very angry. I was very much a victim. I was going through my own recovery. I didn't drink. I'll throw that in there. When I came out of my coma, I said I would never drink again. I knew I had to heal. So um, what I realized in my own forgiving process, I saw that I was in the drunk driver. The drunk driver was me, and I was the drunk driver. Now, for me to see that, I had to get very deep and to really understand that we are, all, we are all aspects of each other. And when I saw that I was a drunk driver on, the, on his side, it was really easy for me to go, oh, my goodness, I can see that now. And it was, um, it was an understanding that when I forgave myself, 
when I forgave myself, even though I was a, a drunk driver, there was still a participation there. Where is that participation? See, this is the key that we all need to see in all these realities. The participation was in fear. The, part, the participation was in I drank patient in the reality. The participation was in my DNA. The participation was in, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of other part- realities that I was in in this. I was giving it power over me. So I was giving the alcohol power over me, which is a great participation, you know, the addiction. So all that, when I saw those aspects and where I played at that, it gave me that, it gave me that oomph and that, that power that we all have, that what I call the Shati power, that Mother Earth power, to heal my, to, to be held by my own self and, and have Mother be my backup. Why, you know, I just saw what I was doing to myself. And, you know, Mr. Spoonhunter, the drunk driver, he was my mirror so I could see. So now I see the gift in this. I see that he was there. And all this exploded and all this happened. But you know what? Now I see that was in my reality that's not there anymore. And now because it's not there anymore, I'm closer to my son even more. See, that's the way it works. Thank, thank you. And um, uh, your book with uh, your husband, Biff, which uh, co-authored the book. You did mention it in passing. It's called Hitting Fear Head-On, relating to, of course, that um, that accident. But uh, why don't you uh, elaborate on that book in a little more detail? Well, the book, what happened with the book, um, you know, about a year into the, the grief, um, people started coming in to me and telling me I need to write a book, and I laughed because... You know, my English was terrible, and um, I mean, my brain injury was pretty hard, but I just thought, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I wrote, you know, a, a, a small draft, and I gave it to a teacher, and, you know, she sat down with me, and she says, you know, you've been through enough hell. You don't need to write this book to go through more hell. And I go, what do you mean? And she says, your brain injury is very detrimental, and I think you think this makes sense, and it doesn't. And, um, you know, that was a hard pill for me to swallow. But you know what? I didn't swallow it. I listened and I thought, no, I am not going to hear that. I am not going to have what I learned is I'm not going to give power to anybody. You know, I gave power to fear. I gave power to alcohol. I'm not giving power to anybody. I'm going to do what I need to do and what my spirit says to do. So even if it wasn't a book, I knew I had to write this and get it out of my system. So that was really the pretense that I did. So that's where I went. And then uh, I did a Course in Miracles for about four years. And a woman just came out of the blue and said, do you have a draft of your book? And I said, yeah. And she says, can I read it? And I said, sure, if you want. So she reads the book, and she says, I see your brain injury. I can help you with this. And I said, you can? And she said, yeah. And so she, she saw the jigsaw puzzle my brain was doing. And so we put it together, and so that was the first the first draft. And then... Um, and then my husband, every time, you know, he would have to sit with me every single time I wrote a paragraph, then at that point in time to make sense over it. To, you know, it was just so jigsawed. So he'd have to sit down, we'd go over it, and then more editors came in, more editors came in. You know, I spent about $10,000 on editing that book because I didn't want, I had such, um, I had read other self-published books, and they, I just didn't care for them because of the editing. So I really wanted to make sure when this story came out that the, the editing was clean, well, and it was, and it is. And you know, and then I had a, a, a New York agent come in and wanted and wanted to publish the book. But it's very fascinating, Andrew, when we are in these realms and we are doing the highest good for all. How it likes to get infected with the snakes, if you know what I mean. And so, um, anyways, through this process, it was getting infected by snakes, and um, this particular person wanted me to change my story. Um, they wanted to have a happy ending. They wanted it to, um, you know, instead of say, I feel, instead of say, I feel, change it to, I knew. So, you know, it was really changing the, um, the psychology and the physiology of the book. 
and the feeling. And I gave my power to that on some level because it was, you know, it was a way to get the book out. And I just didn't have the help and the energy and the know-how to do it. Well, anyways, lo and behold, it backfired, thank God. And um, I had another person come in. She wrote, she read the, the, re, the revised version, and she says, you need to go back, get your power back, and rewrite your book again. So I rewrote it again with the help of my own husband again and, you know, kind of put it back to the original draft and then um, just found another editor to, uh, that did the last editing, and she works for Neil Donald Walsh. And, you know, I just was very, very blessed to have her in my field, and, and we got it out. So, you know, it was about a 12-year process. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy process for me. But, you know what, I didn't give up. I just kept going, doing what I could do. Between my health and the book, that's what I did. Because this is an important message and it needs to get out. We need to understand what these realities are doing and we need to understand how to stop them so that we don't buy their bargain, if you know what I mean. Oh, yes, and... Uh, well, talking to you, listening to you, I don't think anyone would know that you've gone through any sort of brain damage. And I bring this up because recently on one of my shows um, talked about what um, what people in the like this third dimensional reality from a biological standpoint, what do we consider uh, death? And the best definition many would assert is the unavoidable result of an oxygen deprived brain that would signal the that unavoidable result being the death of the telescope, the body through which our consciousness um, resides. However, uh, on that uh, show, I discussed the possibility, well, who says that the brain in the head needs to work for your body to be alive? They say there's another brain in the heart, those in the metaphysics community say. And even if the um, heart in the brain, excuse me, the the brain in the head was not working, um, if there was some way we could transfer everything that the brain in the head was doing to the brain in the heart, we could easily survive without a brain in the head. Do you think maybe that has happened to you where everything in the brain in your head that was damaged has gone to your heart to enable you to function to the point where I don't realize or wouldn't even notice that you have any brain damage now? Yeah, absolutely, because I think that's where the divine intelligence is happening. And I think that, again, that goes back to the energy transmission. Now, on, on a logic scale, I mean, you give me a math problem or you give me, or you tell me to go someplace, or, you know, in an airport, I, I, I can't, I get really mixed up in that kind of situation. However, on um, a multi-level or a multi-dimensional um, spectrum, I'm very, on what I need to do and what I see and what I know. So, you know, that's the divine intelligence I, I know. Now, what I do know, because I did go to the Middle East um, back in 2012, and, um, and I did that. I did that to overcome any fear I had in my field. I did it as a test. I went, I test drove my own vehicle to see what it felt like and how I was going to maneuver through that. And, it, and, I, and I did it through flying colors. It was beautiful. But just because I didn't know my way in the airport, what I did is I knew what to use. You know, I need help. I could use my voice so I could get from point A to point B. See, and that's that part of the, you know, part of the picture here. When it comes to computer stuff, I mean, when you made that when you made that beautiful advertisement for me, I cried because you don't know what I go through trying to make that kind of stuff. It was so nice to have it made. You know, that kind of stuff is where I'm sticky with the brain injury. But on a clairvoyant, I'm very, very sharp. I'm very, very laser. And a lot of that, too, goes to Vipassana meditation that I've been doing for the last 12 years. And that was another gift that came into my field. So, you know, and I, because of the multiple chemical sensitivities I have and I live with now, and that's more Dillon's disease, if you will, and that's from the, um, the antibiotics that they um, overdosed with me with from the MARSA, I can't do any kind of Western medicine at all. I can't do any chemical at all. So I have to do everything naturally. And Vipassana has been key for me and discipline for me to do Vipassana to keep my pain levels at a bay. So that keeps the mind very sharp. And that's what S. Angelka, and if anybody does Vipassana, that's who I suggest you go to. He's sharp. He's to the point. It's donation only. It's not about money, and there's no guru involved, which I think is key to all of this stuff. And um, 
Uh, so anyways, that's, I think, what keeps, it keeps my mind so sharp. It's divine intelligence versus, you know, the other logic intelligence. Uh, okay, fair enough. And Mor- Morgellons disease. It's, I've had uh, one of my listeners, frequent listeners, uh, has that. Uh, don't feel ashamed that I don't know that listener's name off the top of my head or username, but uh, uh, often thinks that that. Um, I remember Morgellons was talked about on an episode of Ancient Aliens, suggesting it has an off-world origin. Although Ancient Aliens, they speculate like crazy. They wake some people up, but they do some of the things they talk about are really far out there. Well, it's History Channel. What do you expect? And um, uh, also suggested that chemtrails play a role in causing Morgellons, uh, some of the um, ingredients in it. That's just a conspiracy theory out there, but I suppose there is evidence for it if people believe that. But you assert that it was from um, antibiotics, using them too much. Um, since, since you've, I'm sure you've looked into Morgellons, uh, can you, for all the people out there that are scratching their heads over the illness because they have it or someone they know has it, can you uh, enlighten them on it? Well, to be honest with you, it was new to me until this last year, and I you, if you can help me, you might remember this. You might remember Andrew, um, not Andrew, Harold Van. He's the black goo guy. He's on base 46. He's it's time loop solutions. He's the pro on this stuff. He's the one that's, that's awakened people to this, that's this stuff, and he's the one that's awakened to me. And he talks about black goo. Now I can look at my my wreck, and when I was hit head on, it was really the black goo that exploded. I call the monster. You know, just a different label, but it's still the same thing. Um, when we understand really what's going on, and he says so beautifully, he shows it so beautifully, he explains it, that it's time loop solutions. He's a beautiful heart. He's a pure heart, and he's a scientist from Germany. And he understands this, he understands this Morgellons disease and what it does. So what happened to me with multiple chemical sensitivities, I started getting very sick about three years after the wreck, perfume, anything, deodorant, anything, I would come home, throw up, migraine for weeks. I didn't know what was going on. I go to the doctors, and he says, I was psychotic. This is in my head. This isn't happening to you. And then I go, really? And he wouldn't help me. He wanted me to do more medicine, so I did more medicine. I got sicker, so I knew I couldn't go that route. Then I started talking to environmentalists. And then they said, you know, you might have to move out of your house. You might have to live outside. I mean, all this stuff. And I'm going, you better be kidding me. And so I just started doing investigation after investigation. And then I found a DL in town. And he basically told me that it's not in my head, that there was a big thing on it back east on multiple chemical sensitivities. And it's kind of those, you know, one of those shush, shush kind of things. They don't want people to know because it's actually created in Western medicine again. And, um, uh, and I know from the, the you know, the car wreck, um, four years, you know, we, we can sue because we found out too late because four years is the statute. But, you know, the reason why they had given me antibiotics is because that first hospital failed to clean my legs out. You know, so there's an E and O, but, you know, they got away with it. And we have to just know what these drugs are doing to our bodies. And I really do think, Andrew, that what I've come to through this whole time, especially the Pashna, they turn something on inside me that I didn't know was even there, and I believe it's a doctor within all of us. But, you know, it's inside, it's free, there's no enslavement with it, there's no business with it, and so, you know, it's our path of freedom, and so it's all of us knowing that it's within us, and um, we have that capability to turn it on and heal. If I didn't have that, I know I'd be dead by now. Um, with the Morgillon, so it is different it comes out in different ways with me it's the multiple chemical sensitivities with other it comes out in skin rashes and it um comes out in different things that come up on the skin and come out and so i don't have that aspect um i do have lichen plenish which is another form of it that i'm learning about this now and um so all of these things are rising from all the antibiotics i was on and i do have the conspiracy theory i do believe that you know, because I'm so aware and so sensitive from those junior death experiences that most people, that they can't entertain that it's toxic in the system, I can. Like, I can go in a bathroom, and if there's Febreze in the bathroom, I will go back out because I can feel how toxic it is in the field where the normal, normal person will go in and they'll just let it be. And the poor children that are in all this, you know, their little systems 
are very sensitive, and they should be subjugated to all this chemical. And if you think about it, I mean, there was a show, a documentary I showed the other day on chemical. You know, it's in the makeup. It's in, you know, diapers. It's in baby shampoo. It's in everything. You know, and, you know, you really got to look at there's some kind of unfortunate dark agenda going on, and we have to wake up to it. No question, and uh, I wrote in your bio here that uh, you are a legislative reformer. I, I often talk about law on my show. Uh, I did want to discuss um, some legislative stuff um, regarding what you do and all, but um, I'll give you the floor for a moment to talk about how, what you did as a legislative reformer, and if you're still doing it, what you seek to do, and then uh, maybe we'll have a little fun with this, a little bit of a debate after you uh, talk about this. So legislative reformer life, what's that all about? Well, you know, I haven't done legislation for a really long time. I've just um, focused on my um, health and, you know, what blue years. So I kind of pulled away from that that world. But what I will tell you what I did in the past. Um, so in Wyoming, you know, it was very fascinating because when we lived in Utah, I could actually feel the pull to Wyoming. I didn't understand the pull, you know, especially way back then. So I was still in the pool to Wyoming, and what I realized after Wyoming, after we were hit head on, that they had some of the worst laws in the United States. And you could drive up to a drive-up window and order, a, a, bought a screwdriver and drive off. And that was that's the way they did things. Now Utah was a more much more advanced in, you know, their laws and consciousness. And Wyoming was very asleep and did not want to look at their stuff. The legislators, there was a big conflict of interest because, again, it's always about money, and they were being paid off by the liquor dealers on not to, not to make the appropriate laws. I had one legislator come up to me and tell me it was his God-given right to drink and drive and to get out of the state. And, you know, so it was really interesting, the, mind, the mindset and the reality I was in back then. Um, fortunately, there was um, a legislator that I worked with, and he'd been working on the open container law for 20 years and we worked together and we did get the law but it ended up being a watered down law meaning that um, at that point in time you can have your passenger drink and drive but that was just a crappy law because all that meant is there's no probable cause now for an officer to pull you over and then if an officer does pull you over you can just hand off your your alcohol to the passenger and then the, the really screwy part that at that point in time, Wyoming needed um, funds, they needed money for their people, they needed work, and um, the federal government was saying, as long as you pass the open container law, we'll give you funds to work on your roads. But Wyoming, they were so narrow-minded and so rigid that they wouldn't take that law, and so they watered it down, and therefore they didn't get the funds. And so that's just what I know with some of the the stuff I saw. It was a a huge, huge awakening. You know, I was kind of one of those people with my head in the sand until I saw some of this stuff that how really, you know, it's not about the people. Not all legislators think that way. It's about their own selfish needs. And then there's some legislators that have our best, are, are there for us. You know, and I saw both. There was two worlds there. So it was very, very fascinating. And then I went to um, uh, the other thing that was very fun. This is kind of an after-death communication thing I can share with you. I I did a testimony in Wyoming on taking from the the 0.10 to 0.08 BAC. And so I did a testimony, and I said, you know, I'm not only speaking for myself, but I'm speaking for the children that were killed in the car crash, including my son and the little girl, Crazy, and the little boy, Malin, that was killed. And I said, um, you know, we need to lower, we need to lower the, the BAC so that, you know, to, to quit causing death and injury. And anyways, it was a very emotional testimony, and I got done. And the rest of the group that I was with, they went and did their drinking in the bar. Of course, I wasn't going to go, so I went back to the hotel room. And um, before I had left... Preston had told me to take the CD player. Now, I didn't know why, but he told me to take the CD player, so I took the CD player. And I'm at the hotel room. I'm getting my coffee made for the next morning. And just I was just going to get in a hot bathtub, and we were going to do more legislation the next day. And as I'm making my coffee, 
there's a CD laying right there by the coffee pot, blank, no name, no nothing. So I'm like, what the hell? And Preston says, Mommy, you know, put it in there. Put it in the CD player. So I put it in the CD player, and lo and behold, it was the song, You're My Hero. So, you know, I just cried and cried and cried because I knew that, you know, there was the higher uppers helping me out with these laws that need to be made. And we really need to look at laws or boundaries. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, we're in this 3D world and we need boundaries. Well, I'm sure you heard during the news segment um, the thing about the courts letting the illegal immigrants um, get off on a drunk driving because of the conspiracy to bring the illegal immigrants, immigrants into this country to screw our lives over. Any comments? Well, you know, I think that that's just a crock. I mean, you know, where's the accountability again? And we know the reason why this this world is like it is now is not a, no no accountability anywhere. So again, of course, you know, they're gonna they're doing this right because to me it's a feed, it's an energy feed. You know, anything that's going to buck our feathers to feed, that's what they want. So the key is, is to be, you know, a zero point filled with everything. That is justice. When we're a zero point filled with everything, and we could, you know, we know how many injustices are in this world. I mean, you know, Monsanto, all of it. So we can go to that place and we can look at the injustices when we can be a zero point filled and anchor the energy in the heart of mother. That's when higher work comes in. We allow, we move out of the way, and divine energy takes over. That is what's going to turn this planet over. That's what's going to flip it. So anything like that that's going to get somebody's goat, somebody's going to get energy, it's going to accumulate energy. That's not what we want because that's going to go to, you know, call it the dark you will. It's a feed. But when we can be in alignment with it and go, this is what is, I see it for what it is, I'm being a, I'm being a zero point field, that's justice. Right, there's the justice, and so within the justice is when divine intelligence can work through us, and we become grace. We don't have to do anything. It's that simple if people could just understand it. It's opening the heart and not judging it. It's looking at it factually and saying, okay, we can see here's the, here's the propaganda again, here's, here's the joke, and so we're going to just go into alignment and say, okay, Mother, Father, God, this is what's going on. This is too big for me. These are your children. You handle it. I'll just stay back and watch and stay in my heart. Uh, thank you. And uh, now comes um, the hard part, uh, a little debate I- I'd like to have with you, and I'd like you to give me a few minutes to um, talk about this. I understand that it is definitely a very stupid idea to drink and then use a car and go on the roads and such and anybody who does that is being negligent and such but from a standpoint of due process it might interest you to know that virtually everybody who's ever been charged with the crimes of DUI or DWI has grounds for having that crime expunged off their record because some sort of due process violation was committed somewhere along the line. Now, there's a couple of things uh, to point out first before I get into why that is the case. Um, first of all, there is, in the strictly speaking in law, there's no term DUI or DWI. The courts have ruled that you can't use slang nomenclature or stuff like that. If you are going to present a case or something, you have to uh, go according to the statutes or codes and the laws saying driving under the influence or driving while intoxicated. No abbreviations or slang nomenclature like that. But the interesting thing is... Um, the term drunk driving, driving under the influence, or any term with the word an offense with the word driving is a transportation specific infraction, be it a statutory infraction or a codified infraction. And all statutory crimes and all codified crimes are in some way commercial. And it works like this uh, the terms transportation, driving, operate, vehicle, and passenger. Those terms all have legal definitions. Now, it, it goes without saying in law, if a word has a legal definition, then it will always, without exception, be different than the standard English dictionary definition. And the standard English dictionary definition is irrelevant in law unless the statutes, the case law, the law dictionaries uh, do not define such a word. And if you uh, follow the rabbit trail 
in the transportation codes, you will find that since transportation is a commercial specific term, then everything in that code, including vehicle driving and all infractions related to it, you cannot be charged with it unless you are using the roads for strictly commercial purposes. And contrary to what we've been brainwashed by society to believe the statement driving is a privilege, not a right. Well, that's only true if you go by the legal definition of driving, which, like I explained, is commercial specific. If you're not using the roads for commercial purposes, you don't actually need a license, insurance, registration, or license plate on your car. Only those in commerce uh, using the roads for those purposes need that. Now, this does not mean that you have the right to use the roads in an unsafe manner, even though those laws and also uh, transportation laws like speed limits, stop signs, red lights, um, even though they only apply to those in commerce, um, you, if you use the roads in an unsafe manner, you can still be charged with negligence, reckless endangerment, and property damage if you cause an accident, and you can be charged with murder if you um, c uh, use your car to kill somebody intentionally, even if you're not in commerce. That's not a commercial infraction. That's a common law crime in which there is uh, some sort of body of the crime in which you do harm. Um, the courts, they uh, get around this because the government can regulate commerce, but the government cannot regulate non-commercial activity um, that we do. And if we're not harming someone, then they'll try to get around that by alleging that we did something in a commercial capacity um, over which there's governmental regulatory authority. And they count on us not objecting to that in court um, or even using the terms ourselves so then they can screw us over and charge us for the commercial specific crime, which isn't technically a crime. It's an infraction. Now, this means that all transportation code crimes, including driving under the influence and driving while intoxicated, people that were not using roads for commercial purposes, they got charged with a crime that is commercial specific, which means that the courts screwed them over. Did they deserve to be charged with negligence, reckless endangerment, and property damage if they caused some sort of an accident or manslaughter if they killed someone unintentionally? Yes, they do. But because those – and also the BAC limit, that's also a um, – uh, something that you have you have the right to refuse a breathalyzer among things because that's uh self incrimination if you're not using the roads for commercial purposes, your rights are still with you, so that that includes your right to not be searched and right to not um submit to some sort of a test or something like that as long as you're not negligent or har harming someone then fine but I mean this doesn't change the fact that you you can still be sentenced pretty harshly if you're not using the roads for commerce and um, kill someone while dry, uh, I shouldn't say driving, I should say traveling drunk. Um, that you can still give you a harsh sentence, but you don't need to be charged with a crime like DUI or DWI um, to get a harsh sentence. So, Laurie, I've babbled long enough. Now that I've brought this to your attention, does this in any way change the way you look at how the courts should handle offenses in which someone who is using the roads for non-commercial purposes is facing um, some sort of a DUI or DWI charge or any other crime that is transportation and such commercial specific? You know, to be honest with you, now you're really testing my brain injury. But I'm just going to tell you from a higher view what I know, what I see, what it feels like to me. To me, it's unfortunate that this happens to some people and that some of the justice system is crooked, just like we talked about earlier. I've talked to a lot of DUI panels, and I've done that for years. And I've seen a lot of um, even policemen come in and talk to these DUI offenders and tell them, this is what you can do to make it easier and to get off easier. The bottom, the bottom line is this, Andrew. You know, I don't want to get caught up in, in different code, different laws, different whatever. What I want to do and what I stand for is that we need to see what is interfering in our energy system. If it's going to cause people to look at, okay, this code is unfair or this code is fair, you know, I really don't even want to participate in that energy any, anyways. I don't want to participate in drunk driving. I don't want to participate in drug and driving. I want to be, and if you think about it, your vehicle, you know, you think of drunk driving, drunk driving, even though I wasn't driving drunk that day, my consciousness was drunk. I was asleep. I wasn't aware. I didn't understand energy. This is the key. When we can understand that this planet is asleep, we're all driving drunk on some level, and we need to all wake up and drive sober and get our power back from it. And whatever that looks like, to me, that's the most important thing. This other stuff, we can get caught in the debate, we can get caught, we can lose all the energy that way, but I'd rather bring the energy in 
and put the heart intelligence on it and allow justice to be served. And everything is divine and perfect as it is right now in this present moment. And these things will automatically fall off and the system will come clean at one point, at one point in time. However, I do want to acknowledge you and validate you for bringing this into the field so that it can come to alignment. Thank you very much. And I, again, I want to point out, uh, everybody, regardless of whether you're using the roads for commercial or non-commercial purposes, must feel, I shouldn't use the word must because that's uh, not the way we should work, but ought to feel an obligation, I should say, to use the roads in a safe manner. And that includes not consuming alcohol before you use your car to travel. So, yeah, let's make that very clear. So, um, moving on, switching gears. Um, you do uh, sessions, talks about on your uh, site how you uh, do sessions with people, and you um, want to talk about after-death communication. Um, for those people that want to um, communicate with their ones on the other side, well, I've done that with my grandfather and also a um, girl that died of a heroin overdose. Uh, thank you Hi. to a certain person listening to the show right now who did that for me, and um, I really appreciate that. And uh, But at my level... I'd like to be able to do this too, communicate with those who pass away because I've told my my grandparents who uh, both have my maternal grandparents who both have uh, dementia um and uh my parents too I've told them this I told them when you all pass away uh, the first thing I'm going to do well I mean it's going to be hard to go over your uh the death of your body but still I know that your body is just a telescope and your consciousness lives on so after I get over the brief feeling of grief over hearing that your body has passed away I will try to put myself in a meditative state to communicate with you on the other side so please um be aware of that and know that that's what I'm going to try to do so you can communicate with me better but some people don't have the awareness, for lack of a better word, to do that on their own and would need to contact a psychic uh, to do that. So for those that really want to try to do this by themselves, do you have any general advice other than believe you can do it? Because simply believing you can do it in this matrix, unfortunately, is not always going to make you succeed in doing something like communicating with those on the other side. So, yeah, I have. I wrote another book called 18 Steps to Transforming Grief. And when I wrote Hitting Fear Head On, Preston said, Mommy, you need to write another book. I said, what? And he said, you need to write the steps on after-death communication so that people can have direct contact. And if you think about it, Andrew, we all need direct contact, and we need to get the middleman out. So my theory is, is I don't want to be a psychic, and I don't want to be a medium. I want to empower those to be have direct contact with the ones that they love because really on the other side all they're trying to do is help us they see the bigger picture they know more of what's going on it's just like Preston telling me mommy don't believe the doctor you know don't go under that spell so you know that's just the bottom line when we all have that residence with our loved ones that come to the other side then we've really got a life jacket on us and I think that this is key and that's why we don't want to become dependent on um, a medium or a psychic and to really use what I call our energy muscle to tap in to that, to that um, dimension to have, to have help and support. But the key is this. We don't want to project and say we need help or we need support. We want to go inside and say, I am feeling I need help and I'm feeling that I need, I'm feeling afraid that I won't connect. We need to validate our feelings so that we can make room for them to connect. So um, I teach a small energy class, and I talk about our systems are like peanut butter when we don't do the work, meaning when we don't process our emotions, when we don't see who's playing us, when we don't see where there's interference, when we're giving our energy or our power away to somebody, or there's other influences, you know, like believing all these drug, you know, advertisements on TV. Not that I don't say that you shouldn't use them, but just be aware. You know, those kind of things is where we need to get back into our system. What happens is when we stop doing this stuff and using the external world for us and we bring it back to the internal world, we get our power back and we build our energy muscle. So let's just say like... um. You know, when I figured this all out, 
because the situation I was in, I moved, you know, from Utah, all my friends are there, and now I'm in Worland, Wyoming, up on this acreage for two, you know, for, you know, this acreage with really nobody around except for myself. And there was really no one there to help me. I went to a couple of grief groups, and it was a crock. It was so, you know, it was just, it did not make sense to me where I was at. And, um, you know, it was like, you know, the five stages of grief. And I'm like, you know, I need more than this. I'm a very deep person. And so then I just started writing, you know, and I think writing is key. But to really know that if we can't connect with our loved ones, there's something going on in our field. Is it guilt? Is it survivor's guilt? Is it whatever is going on? We have to identify what that is. Once we identify with that and see it and allow it in our systems and fill it in on a visceral level in our cell memory, when we really feel that is when that peanut butter starts turning into honey. When it turns to honey, is when they're able to come in because now we're, we're transmuting at a higher vibration. And then they can come and, and, and talk to us more. Then the other thing is, it's like anything building, you know, it's like lifting weight. So now we're weightlifting. So now we hear a voice. You know, is it them? Now, you know, you know, well, you know it will be them by the way it feels. It's empowering. You know, and I know that after holographic kinetics, you know, there was some controversy on tricksters out there. You know, and there are tricksters out there. I'm not going to lie. There are tricksters out there. And what I know is usually how the tricksters work is when there's a middleman. I mean, think about insurance, brokers, you know, everything that has a middleman in it, there's tricksters. So above, so below. So the, 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 the thing is, is bringing it back in, no middleman, and having that confidence in yourself that, boy, I do feel this. I do feel the energy of my loved one. And then with Preston, um, you know, it was just like I would just hear a voice, and it was just like, well, that makes sense. And if it makes sense, you know it's your loved one. If it doesn't make sense and it's disempowering, watch out. Or if you're going to a medium that I've seen over and over again where people will say they're stuck in purgatory and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And what happens is the medium or the psychic, and I'm not saying all of them because I've been to them and they've helped me on some level. I'm just saying that some of them get trapped in needing money and they leave fear at the door, so you go back. And that's what we've got to be aware of. And to me, it's about self-empowerment. It's about doing this yourself. And so in 18 Stepping Stones of Grief, I go through each step of what I did without, that's my son, I call him Nick, his nickname's Bubba, to clear up my energy system so I become more honey. And that's the trick. It's the honey. And when you're honey, you'll, they'll come right in. And then there's sometimes where I have sessions where um, I don't do the after-death communication, but what I'll do is I'll clear, I'll clear that person's bills, helping them know that, well, so what will happen on the other side, because I really want the viewers to know this. When we're holding on to the person on the other side, they can't move. They can't. They're stuck. So this is very unfortunate when we, are, we got such a lock hold that they can't move. And it's usually, it's always emotional related. And one of the tools I always suggest is nonviolent communication. And you can go to nonviolent communication and you can print out a list of feelings and needs. And you want to use those feelings and needs while you're going through the after-death communication piece. You want to clear out your system. What am I feeling here? You know, is it the fear that I'm not going to connect? Is it the fear that I was responsible for, you know, maybe it's a suicide? You know, whatever it is, that is the stuff that gets caught in the web. Then both parties are stuck and entrapped. And this is what we don't want. We want them to fly as high as they can so they can help us. And we want to fly as, as deeply as we can, you hear the word deeply, so they can help us. And root, and root the common sense back into this reality because, again, that's justice. Thank you. By the way, there's a caller in the queue, area code 504. I'll let you on in just a moment. I do want to get one more question out here before I let you on. If you're just listening, fine, then don't ever respond when I let you on. But anyway, um, here on your website, under the key um, uh, thing, it says uh, the difference between 
premonitions versus fear. So why don't you uh, clarify that whole thing for us, those of us who don't know the difference? Okay, so um, so what I realized after, you know, back to high insight again, because high insight is where we learn. High insight is not about shame or guilt. It's a, it's a learning tool that we can go back after the incident has happened and reevaluate what really happened here. And then you ask your higher self, you ask your spirit, and that's all. Don't let anything else in your field. I don't let Preston in my field. Don't let anything in your field, the bottom line, don't channel, don't let guys in, don't let Archangel Michael in. This is all, this is all um, a hijack on some level because we have to remember how strong and powerful we are. We don't need anything. And if we're putting something out that we need, well, then we're giving our power away. You see? Don't understand that. Um, as far as the premonitions and the fear. So what would happen when the thought form is an entity itself? So fear is an, a thought form entity. So what happened is I didn't really know it was a thought form entity. This thought form entity is telling me my son is going to die. What I do is, because of my fearful upbringing, my fear of dying, I project this on my son. I'm projecting my safety on my son. It goes into his field. See? Just want you to see this. And then what happens is I start to identify with the fear of his death. I thought it was a premonition. The truth is, I don't give I don't give premonitions and I don't give um, future readings. Because you know what? We have the power to change it within the present moment we all do. We just have to know how to go into that reality and change it. So I didn't know back then. So I called it a premonition. It wasn't a premonition. It was fear. And if I knew back then to surrender and allow Mother God to intervene on my behalf, I know my son would be alive today. But instead, I went into fear I went into resistance, and I went into control, and I went into savior. Those are all very low vibrational realities. And so that's what happened. So this is how we know the difference. So if if a thought comes in, let's say, um, let's just use Wyoming for a minute. Okay, I have this fear, and I know that it's there. And I'm trying, I'm, and I'm listening to Gary Zubak over and over and over again, the seat of the soul, trying to get some tools because there wasn't very many tools out there at this time. And anyways, what I did is there's a woman that had a car exactly like my car. I'm picking up Preston at some kind of school we went to, and um, she has a car just like mine, and I have a seat belt that was broken, by the way, and it worked that day. It was broken, and it worked the day of the crash. So that was weird, too. But anyways, I was asking her if she knew where a Honda dealer was. And she said, yeah. And then the next thing she says, you know, my son, my my husband, you know, has, you know, a couple of DUIs and he's in jail now for drunk driving. I'm not even talking to her about drunk driving. And this comes into my field like, boom, that. Well, then what I did is I hooked into it and I rolled and I identified with that I wore it, and then the fear like, oh, no, this means he is going to die, you see? So if I would have said, oh, fascinating, here's an opportunity for me to get my power back from this reality. I am not buying that fear. Get out of my way. I know my mind is creating evidence because my unconscious players are back there, but now I see my hologram is showing me, and I'm not buying it anymore. See, this is the key in everything. When we can really see that the universe is showing us where our unconscious drivers are, instead of hook and identify, we think and pull back and say, I don't want to be part of that. What is lower vibrational? Yeah, I don't want to be part of lower vibrational too, so let's do our part to ascend, for lack of a better word. All right, first caller and only caller so far. Area code 504, you're on the air. What's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? Hi, uh, Debbie. And um, I like uh, what she's saying a lot because I believe that that's true. Um, What about absorbing? Have you had problems with that? That's an issue with me. (laughs) Like actually absorbing. 
Yeah, Debbie. Um, my name's Laurie, by the way, just so you know. Um, yeah, nice. I have had huge problems of absorbing. Um, if you look at my horoscope, is I have Cancer Scorpio, you know, which is water, and um, I absorbed I absorbed a lot. That's one reason why I'm, I kind of have issues with, you know, the body that I have because I absorbed so much energy from other people, not knowing mm-hmm. that as a child, as a child I absorbed the atmosphere of my parents, not knowing it, just 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 to have grace in my field or, you know, some kind of sustainability as a child. And as we grow up, what happens is we still have that same habit in our field. So in the highest realms, this is, I was just sharing this with a friend the other day, in the highest realms, there are no boundaries. We are so pure that we don't have to worry about absorption. We don't have to worry about this. But this planet has been so hijacked that now we have to really, we really have to create boundaries for ourselves. Not only yeah. you know, boundaries on the psychology level and the emotional level, but the energetic level. So yeah, let's just use, yeah. So for for an example, and it's kind of like um, a test drive. I'm just going to use that. So you know, my husband has MS, right? And for years, um, you know, 21 years, he, he hasn't had an attack except at the car wreck, and then that one wasn't a real bad one. It was, you know, it was it was bad, but it wasn't, you know, he he, he was able to walk and everything. He came out of it. And then about three years ago, my husband was really going through some, you know, addiction with eating sugar. And, oh, um, gosh, and, I, yeah. I, and I was telling him, you know, you know, Biff, you know, you got to get on top of the sugar. You know, it's it's not healthy for you. And he would just go unconscious and just eat tons and tons of sugar. And then plus we were kind of going through some rocky stuff on our marriage because, you know, sometimes these men are resistant. Andrew, I don't think you are. But, you know, sometimes these men are resistant and they don't really want to do this higher conscious stuff, you know. And that's kind of where I've been at. You know, my husband really kind of thought, you know, on several lengths that, you know, that this I have a brain injury, I'm kind of out there, you know, because he was so resistant to be in my reality. And that's where we were at a lot after the car wreck. And he didn't really want to go to grief. Anyways, Mm -hmm. through that, um, this was just like two years ago, and Preston came to me and said, Mommy, you need to back out of Daddy's build. I go, what do you mean? Wow. He goes, he goes, you're energetically holding up his end. I go, what do you mean? He goes, back out. So you know what I did? I just pretend like I'm a car and I go into reverse, okay? I reverse out of, this is how you do it. I ground and I hit reverse like I'm in my car and I'm going to go reverse. And I back out of his field. And then I even take my hand and I kind of do a motion, like a circular motion, like I'm backing out of his field. I can feel it because I'm, I'm honey a lot, so I can feel what's going on. So in my energy system. So I feel, I feel that I'm back out of my field two days later. My husband into a vicious, vicious, vicious MS attack. He can oh, wow. hardly walk. He can hardly walk. And he went through hell. And so, you know, I just, then I went to press and I said, why, 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 what's in the hell's going on? And he says, it's going to be okay, but he needs to wake up. This is his wake up call. He needs to get wow. on, he needs to get on the evolution path, and he's not doing it. And so we just hold space and watch. And then, you know, about two weeks into it, I told Biff, my husband, you know, I just let you know that your son was part of this, and I was holding you up, and I'm not doing it anymore because I've been energetically enabling you, and I'm not doing it anymore. And this is where we need to be as a society. And I think as empaths and as codependents, we have been so programmed and so conditioned that we don't even know it. And, wow. Debbie, I'm still on the path of learning this, believe me, because it is something that I believe that we have been so enmeshed and so infested as a society that we don't even know. So now when right. I go into Walmart or I go into some place, what I do is I really ground my energy um, and then I just really watch and I become the observer of my reality. And if I wow. see a child cry, I used to hook in. I want to save the child because that was my savior hero mentality, which I don't let, but after Preston's death, I don't let that play with me anymore. I just open my heart, give love to the child, and let it go. See, so these, wow. these different mechanisms that we all have running, especially the empath, the healer, and the codependent. So when well, we understand, I have all that. I have I know, all that I you that mentioned. You. And it's funny because they're like, oh, you're a healer, you're a healer. But then I'm thinking like, what kind of healer would I be if I'm a wreck after, you know what I'm saying? Like, who am I going to, I'd go down I do, with the ship. 
I do know what you're saying, and I did that. You know, I, you know, I have a lot of. Um, I've done a lot of healing classes, and mm-hmm. I've done a lot of different things. But I won't do. I can do remote viewing. That's how I do sessions. If I do them, I don't want anybody that close to me, because I absorb. So that's the way I do it. So when I do a session, um, I do remote viewing. And then I give tools to empower people, depending on what they need, where they're at. I look at what archetypes are playing them, and I look at how we can um, bring that energy back into their field. And once they see exactly what's going on, and they look at the different tools, which I gave a big tool today was nonviolent communication. Once we see all these different players out there, because that's what they are as players, mm-hmm. then they don't play us anymore. But again, mm-hmm. it takes, like you know, it takes discipline. It takes what field yeah. we are participating in. So just the other day, um, just to let you know, I last year, so I've been kind of like on that, which I think we've all done, with the gluten and the sugar. You know, I quit yeah. for the year. Christmas comes around, and I start up again. And then I kind the of, you know, I, you know, yeah, and then I just kind of, you know, then I stop again probably in February or March, and then I go clear with that, and then here comes Christmas, and it's been kind of a vicious cycle for me. Well, I um, received a transmission a transmission from Matt, who does PH360, and I advise everyone to look at that if they can. But anyways, um, I went to a workshop with him, and he said to me, he saw me clearly, and he says, you know, you cheat yourself by doing sugar at Christmas time and gluten. I said, yeah, I do. I said, but I don't look at it as cheating. I feel like if I don't do it, I'm cheating myself. He says, no, you need to look at it the other way. And he goes, mm-hmm. he goes, just know that, you know, you have the power within you that you don't need to do gluten and sugar again. So I just said, wow. okay, you know, I got it. And so I just took it. I grounded it in. I anchored it in. And I haven't had gluten or sugar for a, a year. Well, awesome. a, year, a, year, a year since Jan, since December, well, probably a year and about a half now. What happened in my field? Because I'm not participating in those realities. I'm not participating in the sugar reality. And Preston basically says it's an alien reality. The sugar reality is an alien reality. And I'm not participating hmm. in a gluten reality, which is which we know is another chemical Monsanto reality. So what yeah. happens when I, when I unplug from that field, and I'm already out of the field of the tobacco reality, I'm already out of the field of the alcohol reality, and I quit eating Thank meat you. a long time ago, because I was feeling the abuse from the animals in my body, so I plugged uh, plugged from that reality. So I've unplugged from another all these realities. Well, the more that I've unplugged, the more deeper I'm in with Mother, Father, God. So that when I said mm-hmm. at the beginning of the show that I want to press it in the bubble, really it's mm-hmm. about me being in the bubble. So when we start unplugging from all these realities, which takes awareness and discipline, then we, we go into ourselves more, Mother, Father, God are there to support us and not allow other realities to come in. See, this is the key. Do you see how it works? Do you see how it works? You get more stronger. You get more stronger in your, in your, in your energy muscle field because you're not plugged into it. If you think about, you know, I really want you to see when you think about the empath and how empathic you are, Debbie, and you eat sugar, what happened is you ingested that sugar and now you not only ingested the sugar, but now you've now you're collected to everybody in the consciousness of eating sugar. This morning, and I said, I'm not. I've got to get off sugar, and I'm off gluten, but I'm not off sugar because I'm like, well, I'm not eating gluten, so a little bit of sugar won't hurt. But then, like you, I just started getting worse and worse, and I'm like, I've got. I, it's funny. I just said that today. I have to get off sugar. I'm gonna get off of it. Yeah, I don't and, even you know, think I had any and, today, but I have a headache. Well, you know, the best thing you can do to get off sugar is, you know, I do fruit. I don't do a whole lot because I'm still in the, you know, the yeast like and stuff with this antibiotics. But, um, you know, I do xylitol gum um, if I have mm-hmm. this really bad sugar craving. And, um, I, you know, there's a, I just found well, one that Stevia's not bad, huh? Huh? Stevia is okay. You know, Stevia is okay, but you have the Benal brand. Um, I've I've had a lot of help with my with my health, and I talked to an Ayurvedic nutritionist. And Stevia is okay depending on the processing, 
it, but it can okay. be toxic on the processing. And so the Now brand is the best brand to buy as far as Stevia goes. So, yeah, Stevia can okay. be okay. I mean, hell, my husband's made some great, like, zucchini bread with, you know, um, almond flour, and then he uses awesome. xylitol or Stevia. And he'll use that, and then, you know, I eat that when he uses that. So, you know, that's just what I'm saying. There's, there's, there's different ways we can be creative. We don't need to go into these realities. And what wow. I'm saying is, you know, the xylitol, um, the xylitol is a lot he- I don't think it's, you know, I think it's, I don't think it's, I know it's a lot healthier than sugar. But I know it's that gassy, you know, like, though. You're, 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 it's, what it ga- it makes people gassy, like it hurts my stomach digestion for some reason. Well, then don't use it. I mean, listen to your body yeah, or yeah. use the stevia. But what I'm saying, yeah. like in Germany with the xylitol, you know, they don't have hardly any cavities like we do. I mean, when you That's look amazing. at the hijack, of, of course, people, of course, they want us to have cavities. Of course, they want us to have diabetes. Of course, they want us to lose our health because it's it's a, a money thing again. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So anything, you know, just just start thinking of vibrations. Just start thinking of vibrations that way. Do you, you know, um, get lonely when you're out of the system, like when you're unplugged? Do you know what I, I'm saying about that? I, Cause I, like, I mean, you, I do. I do know what you're saying. But what happens is when you're unplugged from the system like I am, Mother, Father, God are holding me so strongly that I feel like I'm embraced in the arms of Mother. And so there is that beautiful, beautiful Mother Mary, you know, image of just being so embraced that I'm there. And so the loneliness isn't a loneliness anymore. It's a loneliness. It's like in my near-death experience, you know, it was a void, but it was the most peaceful, beautiful essence I had ever been. And so, you know, there's, there's that. You know, don't think I'm going to go out to dinner with my friends and stuff like that. I do. I'm not totally unplugged, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do that, but when you know, when I go out to dinner, I watch what I eat. You know, I mean, just the bottom line. You know, or if right. I go to a movie, sometimes I'll test. This is another way you can do it, Deborah, is you can watch a movie. This is what mm-hmm. I would tell the women that I teach energy with. Because a lot of the new age is like, don't watch movies because you don't want to go into that reality. What I know from Vipassana, when we can be in that reality and we can be in zero point build and sustained that's when we don't absorb the reality. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. When we can be, when we can be so sustained, I watch a movie that's made that might be a little trauma to our system, and we watch, and we go, oh, I'm noticing my heart going off. I'm noticing my stomach ache. And you notice that in your system. You feel that in your body. What happens then is you are dissolving that reality in your body. You know, it's just like my Ooh. book, Keep Your Head On. You guys don't have to go through the tragedy. You guys can read my tragedy, fill it in your system, go through, use that experience, and get the energy muscle that I built from it. And if we all can go there and understand that concept, this is we're going to really up level freedom on a much have, on a much faster scale. Okay. So you know when we're see, when we're watching the news and you see this reality of war and you see the blood and you watch. What is my system doing? How am I reacting? Am I jumping out of my body? You know, am I jumping out of my body? Do I need to go turn off the TV? That's a projection out where you want to go inside your body and watch and go, hmm, interesting. This is where I have work to do. So I'm going to get out my my nonviolent communication list, and when I saw that blood, how did I feel? What was I needing? Mother, Father, God, thank you for your support. And thank you for keeping me huh. safe right now in this present moment. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that would be politics for me. <laughs> that would be politics. Yeah, so if politics just, is what I just want to turn it, it you, off. Yeah, politics, oh, I just want to you, turn it off. Well, if politics does it to you, and that's where your trigger is, that's where your work is. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah. You guys still there? Hi, I just had a power outage at my uh, house, and the power oh went God. on. So, <laughs> so if you tried to communicate with me... Oh, and the lights just flickered again. Luckily, the power didn't go out. So, wow. Yeah. Well, so, were you guys on, talking all the time? On... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's reassuring. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. So um, if, if if I'm all of a sudden not, you can know it's because there's a power outage. We have a rare February thunderstorm going on here in the Philadelphia suburbs. So, uh, 
just be aware of that. It was if lovely. You want I to mean, keep talking. talking was lovely. Oh, okay. Thank you. I mean, she saw me. Really, everything you just you saw me right now. I'm so incredibly empathic. It feels. I mean, I don't. People don't even have to tell me their symptoms. I just absorb it, you know. And then my I go to an EFT guy, and he's like, "Stop doing it." I'm like. Nobody even told me. It's some kind of osmosis. But like you, I was told, he told me, somebody told me I had to take care of everybody when I was a kid, and it just stuck, you know. So that's what I work on constantly, especially with my mother, you know. It's a constant thing. Right, right, right. And, you know, the the thing with your mother is to feel helpless. You know, people think helpless is like, you know, a weak thing. It's really not. Feeling helpless is like, I, you know, like I surrender, this is too big for me. You know, I'm just going to feel helpless in this situation. And when I feel helpless is when divine intervention comes in. Okay. You know, and that's just, that's just where you go. You go to what happens when we absorb, we're not acknowledging our feelings, and we're becoming, we sacrifice ourselves. Yeah. And so what we're, we're moving into, we're moving into, I'm not going to sacrifice myself anymore. I'm going to acknowledge my own needs. I'm going to acknowledge my own feelings, and I'm going to resurrect mm-hmm. myself. Because when I acknowledge that, I'm not projecting out anymore and taking it on. I'm inside myself, inside my own vehicle. I'm driving, very aware, and nothing is getting in my field. Good. That's the lonely part, you know, like you're like, okay, who am I now then? Yeah, am I really this healer? Because it doesn't, you know, it's kind of empath and healer doesn't feel... Um, healthy together, like, you know, like you need that. Well what, happens, we, well, what happens to the ego when we're going through these different realities is there's been some kind of identity being a healer or we've had some kind of identity where we sacrificed ourselves in some other lifetimes and some past time loops that we've been, and we've been traumatized by them. And so here we've been right. traumatized by them, and now we're in today in this present moment, and we wonder why we feel like we feel when we're in somebody's space. So now what we're doing is it's not lonely. It's not a lonely world. What it is, it's a world with space in it. When space arrives is when the magic happens. Okay. So wow, it's not thank lonely. you so much. You're, I mean, you're really what? incredible. You're incredible. Well, thank you, sweetheart. So are you. I mean, I appreciate everything you're doing. And looking at yourself, I mean, this is key. This is really the key to to really um, cleaning up this planet, and this is what we all need to do. So thank you for having the courage and asking me. That means a lot to oh, me. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling in, Debbie. Thank you. Okay, no, thanks. Bye. probably should listen to this whole again yeah, to see what I missed during me. the power failure. <laughs> okay. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Debbie. Take care. Thank you so much. All right. Well, um... I just asked my angels and guides to make sure the power doesn't go out again. It's a miracle. I guess they're with with me because uh, the lights around the house just uh, got dimmer a couple times with the computer still on. So uh, maybe they heard me. But speaking of miracles, um, I see on your uh, website uh, you talk about manifesting miracles into your life. I'd like to talk to you to talk about that. Just so you know, we have uh, it's eleven eleven. What synchronicity? Eleven eleven. Eleven minutes. Eleven eleven seconds left on the uh, live feed. We can go a little past two hours, but let's try to keep this to two hours if possible. Uh, just anybody after that will have to call into the show to hear us. Uh, what? First of all, what is a miracle? You got to give the definition of a miracle because there's a lot of debate over what can be a miracle and what can't be, and how do you recommend people manifest it into your life? Ten minutes and forty five seconds left on the live feed. And Andrea, what I believe a miracle is are things that happen unexpected for the highest good of all. You know, it's not about an agenda. It's not about me. It's about when things happen for the micro, for the macro. That's what I would say a miracle is. Um, one of the miracles I can say with Preston again, um, this was about probably, you know, the second year of grief, and I'm driving you know, three hours to Cody because I finally found a grief counselor that resonated with me, but he's three hours away. And um, and, he, and I'm driving back by myself, and Preston said, Mommy, get off that Vioxx. And I'm like, what? And they had me on it, you know, a ton of drugs feel, you know, with everything I was going through. And I go, why? And the Vioxx, you know, is for inflammation from my legs. And he goes, it's going to give you a heart attack. I go, really? 
And he says, yeah. And I says, all right, I'll get, I'll get off the Vioxx. So I came home and I told Biff about what Preston had said. At this point in time, Biff thought I was crazy. You know, I mean, he really did. He thought with my brain injury and he didn't really, you know, he didn't really want to believe Biff has a heavy had. He's a lot better now, but he had heavy, heavy Catholic programming um, uh, around the rest of the time. And so anyways, um, I went ahead and went off the Vioxx and then three or four years later, I'm seeing where people are getting killed from the Vioxx and having heart attacks. So to me, that's that's a pretty awesome miracle. Thank you. You know, somebody and... from the other side is telling you to get off the drug. Hmm. Okay, thanks. And uh, I think I got a little help um, from the other side uh, in regards to me getting off alcohol. When I turned um, 21, I was um, drinking a lot, but I was able to quit. And now I, uh, okay, I will admit I did actually... Um, have some beers down when I was at the N5D conference in my hotel room by myself watching the news at night. But um, before then, I hadn't uh, drunk alcohol in months. Um, it's not my thing anymore. But uh, enough about me. Uh, in your love offering thing here on the key section of your website, it says the law of giving and receiving as part of the universal law is part of the universal law of energy. Uh, giving and receiving are essentially the same. It is important to have universal balance. Okay, uh, giving and receiving are essentially the same. Could you elaborate on that statement? Yeah, because I believe you know some of the you know because I've been I've kind of been in all different realities. I mean you know the UFO reality, the Christian reality, the, you know, um, Mark Pistacio reality. You know, I've done a lot of investigation, and I kind of look at all these different things, and I'm trying to put it all together. And there's some misconceptions on things that I see is happening out there sometimes because, you know, it's it's a complicated, it can be very complicated out there if people haven't experienced these different, you know, different experiences. And because of Apostina, again, you know, I'm going to give, you know, S. Angianca, rest his soul, um, but uh, what I have learned in this reality that when you become into, I'm going to put quote, quote, oneness. So when I'm at a, a Vipassana retreat and I'm meditating for 10 days for 11 hours a day in silence, and I've done this eight times now, and then I come out and I eat a hamburger and then I fall apart and my body hurts like I've been beaten to death, I got to really look at what in the hell is going on here. So what I saw was I was putting that slaughter in my my body, and I had to stop. And that was kind of you know the give and receive. What what that cow gave me was the pain, so I could see what I was doing to myself because that's another hijack. And so that's a, a kind of form as give and receive and the oneness reality. On an energy reality, I think that people have a misconception because it's spiritual or there's some kind of mind control out there that people shouldn't get paid. And um, I was one of them. I mean, I have to say I gave, I, gave my, I gave things away a lot. And I've hit this point to where I'm valuing myself now. And um, it's more about an energy exchange of value. You know, money's energy. And, you know, so how can we value each other? So, you know, what, you know, so, you know, if I write a blog and someone's getting value from it, I would like to give that person $10 or $5, whatever. This is where we're kind of going as a society because I think we need to, the people that are awake, we need to start acknowledging each other, become in alignment with each other, and supporting each other. Because really, you are I am you, and you are and I am you, and you are me. And when we can really understand that concept, the world will change. You know, it's like Mary Magdalene. You know, a lot of women say that you know they channel Mary Magdalene. I also see Mary Magdalene. I don't say I channel Mary Magdalene. What I know of Mary Magdalene is she's an aspect of myself. Because I also know her energy from past lifetimes. Whatever that looks like, I don't need another story, but I know she's an aspect of myself. We can, you can understand that's how the holographs are made, then we can understand how the mechanism works. Did that answer your question? 
Oh, yes, I understand how the hologram is made. Of course, we're all infinite consciousness, space and time are illusions. Everything exists because our consciousness tells us it exists. I've been saying it on my show since all the way back from day one when I first started doing this show. But, um, yeah, you mentioned an interesting thing just now. Um mentioned how you like sometimes wanted to give things away because you didn't want to do it for the money. Um, that seems to be like a big barrier in this um, matrix. I mean, I... I it, it funny you mention that because yesterday on that I mentioned during the a news segment when yesterday I was listening to Mr. Cat Eye's uh, presentation about Alex Jones thinking that he works for the Zionists and the Mossad. He also said Alex Jones is is doing it for the money. And I remember on that um, conspiracy with Jesse Ventura episode about the reptilian aliens, they were like David Ike's doing it for the money. And and well, you wouldn't be saying he's doing it for the money unless you couldn't think of any other reason why he was doing it. Unfortunately, that's not the way a lot of people uh, look at it. So this whole dilemma of whether or not one feels that they should do something for free because they think that doing it for the money will discredit or demonize them in some way, um, that's an unfortunate fact of reality in this duality matrix, it seems. Um, are there any suggestions you may have for to how to get over that barrier since you obviously made it um, made a statement about how it meant something to you, giving things away for free sometimes? Well, you know, I mean, it has been a huge barrier for for me, and um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie about it. It has been very hard for me because you know my my mind is you know, hey, this is source energy, you shouldn't charge for it, blah 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 blah. It's kind of where I've gone, you know. And I thought, wait a minute, you know how much money I put into these workshops? I mean, fifteen thousand dollars. And you know, I'm sitting here going, wait a minute, and I sit here and I'm. And it's my time and it's my energy. Something, and then what was happening, I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and I realized there was an imbalance. And I saw, wait a minute, this is value piece again, which would go back to my childhood. Of course, my parents didn't value me. So now what I do is, you know, to me, it's not about, you know, um, you know, the James Ray type. I don't know if you know James Ray, but he was, a heavy metaphysical teacher and, char- and charged a ton of money, and he ended up in prison because he was using some black magic, and I told him he was in a letter, and he got caught when I went to one of his things. So anyways, what it boils down to, when we are using money to, to take advantage of per- a person, then that's when, we, that's when to me that it's in balance. But when there is an alignment with the money, we all need to get paid for what we do, but I don't think anybody should be turned away. I mean, if I didn't have the healers, the cranial sacral therapists, I mean, I make $950 a month on disability. I didn't get a damn dime from that car wreck. And if I didn't have the healers step in and say, Lori, what can you pay me to see me, you know, four times a month because your body needs help, you know? And I said, well, let me go home and look at my budget. And I come back and I says, I can pay you $40 a session. They charged 200 and they said, okay, this is what I'm talking about. This is where we need to go. Nobody should be shut down because they don't have the money, but we should do some type of exchange, and I don't care if it's barter. That's how I feel about it. Yes, and just to um, make everybody who's doing it for the money, not that you're doing it for the money, feel better, I'm just going to say, if you want to donate to me, go to natureofrealityradio.blogspot.com and click on the donate button. Now people are going to accuse me of doing it for the money, which is okay, because what other people think about me is the least of my problems. So on that note, I guess I'm going to uh, bring this show to an end. I've got 45 seconds on the live feed, so Lori, I'm going to tell you. Inter- and if I could interject on you, with you, Andrew, really quick for the 45 sure. seconds. Go ahead. It is so hard to market a book and get it out, especially when you have health issues. So what you just gave me was a huge gift. And so I hope your I hope your listeners know that the donation is not only a gift to you but a gift to themselves. And that's really what it's about. When you know you're giving to somebody else, it's a gift to you. Because what did you receive on this show today? And that's where it's at. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you go to LaurieBoggs.com and order my book. 
I will certainly look into that. I'm currently uh, got a couple books on my uh, schedule of books to read. Got to finish reading right now. Michael Tsarian's book, Atlantis, Alien Visitation, and Genetic Manipulation. I'm just not reading the book part there. I'm also going to make a mission to read all the appendixes in that book, too. I like to read the appendixes. They're pretty interesting. So uh, when I'm done that, I will um, probably read what else I have on my list. And at some point, I will order your um, your book. So with that being said... Uh, I'd like to uh, do the most emotional part of every single show. And uh, well, first of all, if you ever want to um, want to come on some sort of a radio show to talk about something, like you have something new to say or whatever, by all means, give me a buzz, and I can give you like a thirty-minute to an hour special to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. But as far as me asking you or any of my other previous guests goes, ever since I started doing this show from day one, I've always had a a mission of sorts, a resolution to always try to get as many different guests on my show as possible before I give any one specific guest double dips. So if I don't contact you to come on my show again, please understand that that's only because I need to fulfill my mission to get lots of other fascinating individuals like you a chance to have some glory on my show. But I promise you I will upload this interview to YouTube. I will spread it far and wide by posting it on social media networks like davidike.com, planetinfowars.com, and other uh, media sites like that, uh, and truth movement sites like that. So I hope this will... uh, Inspire people to take your words, buy your books, and uh, maybe do a few sessions with you and everything. And there's no doubt people can learn a lot from this interview we did today because I sure learned a few things. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, too, Andrew. God bless you and love you, sweetheart. Bless you. Namaste. Take care now. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, that is the end of this show. Uh, next week, I checked my schedule. I made sure to do that before going on my show because I didn't do that last week to announce that Lori Boggs was coming on. Shame on me. Um I will be have. I'm supposed to have a uh, Sharon Picard on the show, but I noticed on the schedule that I wrote maybe um, uh, the, the week after that uh, after this, implying that it wasn't quite guaranteed that she'd be able to come on. But she did. I remember her saying she wanted to come on, but I don't know if she necessarily responded to my uh, my uh, re- request that she come on a week from today. So. I'll uh, communicate her by tomorrow at the latest, and if I can't get her on or any replacement on, I'll definitely do be doing the show by myself. I'll find something worthwhile to entertain and enlighten and expand the consciousness of all of my listeners by myself. So that is the end of this show. This is Andrew Fisher signing off from Nature Reality Radio. Uh, thank you, Guardian Angels and Spirit Guys, for not letting the power go out when I wanted to talk. I appreciate that. Uh, namaste, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Trek Thought Infinite Consciousness.